So, yeah, what are we going to do? Quick intro barcodes. Uh, I'm going to talk about encoding, decoding, scanners. Some simple tricks, some more simple tricks. Um, some backend stuff and some unsolved cases and stuff. Um, so, this is actually all not really hard. So, relax. You don't need your brain, or at least, like, the left side of it. Um, what about history of barcodes? Like, they got developed in um, 1948 by two people. And um, the first usage attempt, and that's actually really funny, um, was the American Railroad people that tried to barcode all, um, all the cars that they have. It took them 17 years to label all the cars, and then the system didn't work. Like, it never did. <laughs> At that point in time, people figured barcodes are useless. Um, however, 1966, um, the National Association of Food Chains um, started to require having barcodes um, on products to speed out the checkout process so they could make more money. And that usually tends to be a really good driver for technology, either making more money or porn. So in 69, um, the same requested a industry standard, which later became the UPC code that you all have on your grocery products and stuff here in the States. And since 81, um, the US Department of Defense required a code 39 barcode on all products that are sold to the military. And um, you will see why that is a bad idea. So in barcode speech, um, the little like barcodes, that, the thing that we just call barcodes are called symbologies. Um, and we have one dimensional symbologies and two dimensional symbologies. Um, here you see a few samples. And the smarter ones of you will actually start to notice that um, the R in the samples, and it's probably just hard to read. Um, some of the samples contain only numbers. Some of the samples actually contain letters. So we can actually have letters in barcodes. Here's some more symbologies. Um, we will talk about a few of those in more detail in the talk. Um, this is just an overview. So there's a bunch of different um, symbology standards out there. Um, and they differ mostly in error correction, and they differ also in uh, what resolution you can print them in, and all kinds of other stuff. So it's really like with protocols, like everyone invents his own. Um, then you have like really weird barcodes, like this, the upper one you've probably seen on envelopes. And this is actually a PostNet barcode. This is actually a routing information for letters. Um, the British, always being their separative island folks, um, of course had to invent their own postal barcode that roughly looks the same, but it's the British one. And then we have two-dimensional barcodes. Now, if you look at this graphic and then you look at your batch, who can tell me what type of barcode you have on your batch? Data metrics, that is right. And you will like, probably notice that this data matrix here looks a bit different. It actually has like a cross in the middle. This is because you can cluster them. So you can actually extend the amount of information that goes into a data matrix code. That is true for most two-dimensional barcodes. Um, you often see at stake barcodes on UPS parcel. Um, I've rarely seen maxi code except for on stuff that Cisco sent me once in a mail. Um, and PDF barcodes are widely used in Europe um, for ticketing systems, and we're going to co go into those later. Now, when you see a barcode and you need to decode it, like how many people raise your hands if you actually decoded the barcode on your batch? <laughs> yeah, you kind of like were sitting next to me. <laughs> okay, cool. So some people actually did it. Um, now, are you interested in knowing what's on there? It's a URL, and I'm not telling you which. <laughs> yeah, it, it seems to be part of like a scavenger hunt kind of thing. Um, so essentially, if you want to decode a barcode, there are two ways. Um, one is you just take a scanner and go like beep, and then see what's on your computer screen. And the other one is decoding software. Um, this is what I use. Um, some decoding software is free. 
Um, other decoding software um, comes for the cost of like a few hundred dollars or the modification of two bytes. Um, and I'm like really lazy, so I went to capitalist way and actually bought one that was really expensive, but it's really good. Um, most scanners actually output the stuff directly into your keyboard loop. And that's the older scanners. You also have USB. Um, so they're actually seen as input devices by the computer. Um, and that makes it really easy. You don't need any special software. So assume we want to generate barcodes. How do we do that? Um, so there is a very good for one dimensional barcodes. So There's a very, very good generator. Uh, which is surprising because it is called GNU, and it's actually good, and, like, it even compiles. Um, so this GNU barcode is actually decent, and you can, like, generate a lot of barcodes with it. Um, you can online generate barcodes. There are many PHP scripts and stuff to do that. Um, there are uncountable commercial solution. Um, many of them actually ship as um, true type fonts, which I find kind of weird, but... You can do that. Um, you can write your own generator really easily. The fun part is um, you need the specs. And the specs actually come in a very, very fucked up form. Like, I was actually buying the specs for the ad state code. And the way you get them is you get a scanned in uh, printout that was written on a typewriter way back that has, like, hand corrections in it. And this is what you pay 20 US dollars for. So go figure. But it's really easy. Generation is really easy, as with everything. So in general, um, barcodes are used for like three different things. And I have to excuse the German in the slide, but there's just no other way to say it. Um, either they're used as tags and IDs. Um, so you're just putting a number on something and tag it. Or the two-dimensional ones are actually used to, um, as virtual data transport or virtual to physical, because barcodes have this unique property that you can send them by email and then print them out, and you get a physical data carrier in your hand that you call email. And this is what people actually use in Europe a lot. I don't know how much it's used here. Um, the third application they're used for is utter bullshit, and we will cover some of that as well. So now we're coming to the first interesting thing about barcodes, the scanners. The scanners that like face outside to a potentially hostile barcode um, are actually configured by barcodes. So you have a scanner. The one side faces to an attacker, and the other one is connected to a computer. And you actually configure it from the attacker side, which is really stupid. So what happens is this. You have a special like enter configuration mode barcode that ships with every scanner. You scan this enter configuration barcode thingy, and then he goes in config mode, and then you can scan other barcodes that, like, change the configuration, like the output character set to Japanese or something, and then uh, you send a, um, you scan an end of configuration barcode, and it gets saved to the scanner. This is really not a good idea. <laughs> I mean, you really change how this device works. I've actually seen a scanner that offered software update over barcode, um, which was scary. What the hell? So and this is essentially what you do. You go to the vendor's um, page, and you know, like you, many vendors actually post the configuration um, barcodes on their web page. Um, you can just like call up the dealer that like sells those barcode scanners, um, and then you reconfigure it. You can change the supported barcode types, um, which means that the system that formerly thought it's only accepting um, let's say UPC barcodes, now suddenly accept all types of barcodes. Because one thing that you need to know is all the scanners support all the barcode types. Like you don't buy a separate scanner for a UPC or something. The chipsets became so easy and cheap that like all the scanners support all the barcodes. And you have to actually configure them away. So the system that used to only accept UPC with a single, simple, simple configuration, more beer. Um, will suddenly accept pretty much everything you feed it. Not good. Some scanners actually support special key codes. This is cool when you have a cash register system that still runs on MS-DOS, for example. Um, 
There are many of those because they're really stable in contrast to modern operating systems. Um, the thing is, with the special barcode that like has a special key code, you can actually go and scan an escape key. And since it's looped into the keyboard, it actually has the same effect as someone hitting escape on the keyboard, which means it's going to exit the cache register application. Um, <laughs> quite nicely, um, you can pretty much shut down entire shopping centers. Um, yeah. So the easiest hack in quotes with barcodes is in most cases actually just copying them. Um, if, the, if the barcode actually transports the information that you want already, get a good camera or get a, and get a printer, make a picture, print it out, have a copy of the barcode and use that one as well. Happens so, there is a, stand up, come on. There is this person who actually, um, like at pH neutral, we have those badges, and some of those badges are the alcoholic badges. Like you can actually get free beer with them. And this guy didn't want to pay beer, but get free beer, so he actually took a picture. Thank you. Actually took a picture of someone's get free beer badge, and then went to the copy shop and got it printed out and laminated, and like got free beer which is why we now have chip cards. <laughs> Another thing, um, like, I don't know how common that is here. Um, much of this is um, European-centric. So, so um, many parking systems, like parking garage payment systems, actually use barcodes nowadays in, in our areas. And for the, for the residents, they have like special barcodes, and so, I ended up in a, in a hotel and they gave me for a parking place in, in a city in Germany, um, they gave me a long-term pass because I was staying at the hotel and so I didn't have to pay for the parking. Now this long-term pass is just a simple encoded number and I don't need to actually know what this number means because I can just copy it and then like distribute around like free parking passes for the city center, which I actually did. Um, so you guys don't do any of that recycling bullshit. Now, it's really, really bad in Europe. So they make you actually come back, like bring back your empty bottles, and then they make you stand in front of a machine and feed them individually into this machine until you are done. Um, the whole process actually takes longer than drinking the beer. So <laughs> this is really retarded. And they are using um, barcodes that come out of the machine, they get printed out of the machine, and you walk up to the register um, and get your refund for the recycling, right? So, getting paid for drinking beer. Um, the thing is, in those systems, they actually have no connection between the recycling machine and the cash register. That means all the information has to be on the barcode. Like, there is no other way to transport the information. Um, and the vouchers that they use that come out of the machine are EAN13, which is like our version of UPC. It's just a bit longer. Um, and this EAN13 is actually the, the super standard that UPC is under. And your UPC is actually missing a leading digit, a zero. That's what, why it's not printed. Um, all other countries have a leading digit that says from which country this product comes. And there are special use digits too, for example, is used for store internal use. Now what I did was like, I actually went, actually I didn't do that, um, someone else did that for me. Um, went to the store and gave back two bottles. And so you see, I'm getting back like 55 cents euro, which is about $2. Um, <laughs> and when you're, when you're checking down here, can I, nah. Those are all fixed, yeah, I cannot walk around. Um, when you're checking down at the barcode, it actually ends with 0555. Now, if you happen to know that the last digit is actually a checksum, so it's not part of the transported data, it suspiciously looks like the amount of money that you get back. Now, we got a second bottle checked in, and that was 25 cents, and it exhibited the same pattern. So you can actually like count it and see that you can get up to 999 euros in refund for like returning stuff, um, which is actually pretty decent. 
The thing is, um, Berlin is full of people that don't like to work, but to drink a lot.